Okay, so uh, I see patients on the outpatient service and the inpatient service with Bruce uh, that relate to stroke and stroke recovery. And my research lab is interested in stem cell therapies um, and the basic mechanisms by which the brain uses to repair and recovery and how we might identify in those basic mechanisms new drugs that, uh, that, would, that would promote recovery. And this places us in the middle of a lot of interesting intersections between biotechnology companies, big pharmaceutical firms, and others that are interested in developing therapies for stroke that are novel. And so I thought I'd describe a little bit of what that means. How is a new therapy developed? How is it validated and moved forward so that we can discuss that in relationship to some of the things that are ongoing out there now? <clears throat> So the problem, one, one drug is approved for stroke, and it's a clot buster, TPA. Um, there are no medical therapies that promote recovery for brain repair, just this one that helps open up the, the vessel. The solution is simple. Why don't we just develop new medical therapies for acute stroke damage and, and those that promote recovery or brain repair? And the hang-up when we think about this is that the news and Internet are full of exciting discoveries and promising therapies. In, and we know them, you know, we hear them through the rumor mill, we see them on the internet, hyperbaric oxygen, stem cells, and all kinds of other things. And one question might be, why aren't these in greater use? If these look like they work, why can't we just start using them? Some of them are certainly around for other choices. So I thought I'd go through and how that's done. How is a new therapy evaluated, both from scratch, when you discover something, and when you have one already out there, how do you move it from one disease to another? And so if you have an idea, <clears throat> say uh, a major focus in my lab is what's a new molecular target that might help the brain form new connections, for example. There's a process in which you have to understand what, how this works. You test it in vitro on cell cultures and tissues. You test it in animal models of stroke. You have to determine if it's toxic, what kind of dose works, how it's effective. And then you start to work up to a safe starting dose in animals that might lead to humans, and then you make your clinical trial design. So all this is before you even really get into humans at all, and it's also before you even get to the FDA. So all of this you do on your own, and then interact with the FDA to try to develop what's called an investigational new drug application, or an IND, and that's here. So then the agency, and I've been in the middle of these discussions with them for stem cell therapies, they review all of this work, and then they might grant this IND approval. So that's the process starting from scratch. What happens next? Well, next we go into human testing through several different phases. And if they're successful, we pop out at the end. The new therapy is licensed. And then after clinical approval, data is still gathered to understand what this might mean for patient safety, because all of a sudden, 10 to 100-fold more patients from the, from the trial stage are going to start using it in real life, and we still have to track that. There's been some notable incidences in which drugs that did not appear toxic here all of a sudden had so much more use that toxicities popped up, so that's often called a phase four trial. What do these mean at each step? Well, phase one trial is usually first in human. It used to be called first in man, but we're no longer patriarchal. Mm -hmm. um, and this means simply giving the drug in a pre-understood dose and looking at safety. There's no study for efficacy in a phase one, although you'd like to see it. But it's a small trial. You're primarily looking for, is the therapy toxic? How is it distributed in the body in general and over time? And you start to understand what dose might lead to a further test. And it's often in healthy volunteers people who don't even have the disease. So you can rapidly get 10 or 15 patients, test the drug, test it at different effects, and look for no harm. If that works, we then go to a phase two, about double the size. In this case, we add the disease. So we might go from normal healthy patients to stroke, and we start to see if the drug works. Sometimes this is divided into 2A and 2B, but in general, phase two, we start to look for efficacy we continue safety testing, we're double the size, and we start to really nail down how we would do it to really understand in a large group if it's going to be definitively successful. And that's what gets us to a phase three trial, where we have a very large sample size, hundreds of patients. We determine in this case if it's efficacious in stroke, we monitor side effects, and we want to put in a commonly used comparative treatment. And that's what's really critical. 
it's no good to test this in isolation because you don't know in your controlled conditions how well the best competitive therapy might work. And it's really not useful to generate a whole bunch of therapies in which one is no better than the other. So we really need this commonly used treatment comparison. And then finally, we hit this stage where we um, are now licensed and in long-term use. So there's a couple of ways in which you enter this pipeline. One is new drug development. So we might find, for example, a drug that can reverse the phenomenon of brain stunning. So, so my lab and others have found that the tissue adjacent to the stroke is stunned, and that might be reversible in a, in a pharmacologically tractable kind of way. That's a new idea. It needs a new drug, and we have to go down the whole track. A previously approved drug that's out there might pop into one of these further segments because it's already there in another disease. It's in humans. We just need to compare it for safety in stroke patients and against a comparable therapy. So there are a couple ways to enter this. <clears throat> the key point in all of these is that we have to have a couple of common principles in how we test drugs for stroke or other diseases. One is when we take patients in, we really need to randomize them. We need to do this in a way in which equal numbers of patients are sorted to get the trial therapy and the comparative therapy in a way in which they're, they're, we don't group them and, and subconsciously introduce bias. Like the first five from site one might go in to get drug and the first five from another site might get the placebo. There could be differences from site or from patients when recruited that way. So they're randomly placed into the study. The second is blinding, and Bruce Dobkin touched on this a little bit, and I'll get into this in, with some examples. But the key here is that the patient and the physician, or the trialist, don't know who's getting the therapy. Because like it or not, consciously or subconsciously, we are biased. We kind of want to see our new thing work. And if somebody comes in and we think they're on it, we might consciously or subconsciously find a little more of a better movement or a little more of a fluid gait than the person who we know got placebo. So it's important that the analysis and, and, of the, and, the, pa and the patient, the analyst and the patient are blinded. And finally, it needs to be compared to something that's inactive, but that highly resembles the treatment drug so that no one really knows who's getting the in inactive medicine and who's not. In headache and migraine trials, in which patients are in chronic pain, and if you give them anything and tell them that it, it'll, it'll help improve, the response rate to placebo in some of these migraine trials is 55 to 60 percent. So that's pretty substantial. It doesn't sustain itself, and so over time it drops back to zero. But you can see the placebo effect is strong and significant. So how does this play out? <clears throat> I have a couple, two examples here. Why are these principles important? Here we have Dr. Cuddy Sark. He has a drug that he thinks will improve stroke recovery. It's approved for another disease, but Dr. Sark thinks it may work for stroke, although there's no evidence that it does. So Dr. Stark would like to treat patients with this in drug, but ins because insurance won't cover the cost because it's never been shown to work in stroke, Dr. Sark gets the drug at a specific cost and marks it up so that he can charge a certain percentage to cover his time and effort. Is it the magic bullet? So Dr. Sark treats several patients and then evaluates the recovery. He feels that they are improved, but is it possible that Dr. Sark's observations are biased by his interest in moving the drug forward for more general use? And how would he study it without introducing his own biases? And that gets into the issue of blinded evaluation. So the problem here is Dr. Sark is making money and he wants to treat more patients. When looking at patient data, he may be thinking drug. And it's important to introduce blinding because this could even be subconscious and we need to remove that. And that's how we start to move new drugs and new therapies down the pipeline. The flip side is also true. Dr. Sark asks patients if they are better. They all paid out of pocket to receive the drug. Is it possible that the expectation of receiving a new experimental cure causes a patient to look for and find improvements that may be really not there? And so that's the blinding on the patient side that's so critical. What about another example? So we, here we have Dr. Margin All Dollar and the Foggy Memorial Health System, and they've just purchased a hyperbaric oxygen unit. The system costs around $20,000, and the whole team is eager to treat patients and use it. 
Hyperbaric oxygen is really only proved for, for non-healing ulcers and for deep sea, di deep sea diving accidents, the bends, some of which we see in, in UCLA neural rehab because of our proximity to diving spots in the Pacific. But Dr. Aldala reasons that stroke is a lack of oxygen, and he tells patients about the benefits of supplying more oxygen to stroke patients. Soon he has treated several patients. The pay treatment involves getting into the chamber, and some patients are initially skittish, but Dr. Aldaler tells him that this helps wound healing, and he initiates the therapy with great aplomb. The patients get in, the lid closes, the, 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 the hyperbaric oxygen uh, flushes in, and the question is, is the ceremony and circumstance of an elaborate medical procedure, do these set up an expectation of the improvement in patient and physician? How would we evaluate this for a real effect? And one way might be to put patients in the chamber and do hyperbaric treatment on some, but on others they just get regular room air. And that would be a great way to evaluate the efficacy. And interestingly, it's never been done. Many of you know that hyperbaric oxygen therapy units are offered for stroke patients, and it would be great if it received an adequate trial. Should Dr. Aldaler and his colleagues at Fo Foggy Memorial be aware of who received the treatment and who did not? Should they be blinded? And should they charge for the treatment if there's no evidence that it works? And Dr. Dobkin mentioned how true clinical trials do not charge the patients. In fact, that's why some of them are so expensive. So let's contrast this from, a, from work we're doing in the stem cell field that is really a kind of a bootstrap approach. There are, there are a lot of offshore treatments in stem cell therapy for stroke, and when you really look at them closely with an expert eye, you find that they actually often don't know what cells they're given. They're clearly not stem cells in most cases. And so working with Gary Steinberg at Stanford, we've been developing a stem cell therapy in stroke, and the rationale is that it works in many animal models in independent labs. It works in blinded, uh, randomized studies in mice and rats. But the diligence here is, could this treatment candidate as a cell work in humans? You've got to reproduce the preclinical or the animal data. Then you have to do a lot of manufacturing diligence. Can you scale up? It's easy to treat a mouse, but we're going to need billions of cells to treat a human. Can we scale up and still maintain quality in the cell product? And that's a critical issue. And then can we get it to FDA approval? And the decision has to go through several steps to get there. And so I thought I'd conclude with a high-level Gantt chart of what it's taking us to get there. These are the traditional developments of a biotechnology uh, process for taking a cell therapy into an FDA approval. They involve efficacy testing, toxicology testing. This is a huge element in cell therapy development, process development and manufacturing, because you're manufacturing a product that isn't a drug. It's a living cell, and when you give it to the patient, it's going to be with them for their entire life, and it's not theirs. And so it's absolutely critical that you know what you're giving, what it's like, how it varies lot to lot, and ultimately, you've got to make sure that it's safe because it, unlike a drug, when you stop taking the drug, it goes away. When you stop taking a the stem cell therapy, you still have those cells. And finally, what's our target product profile? How are we going to develop it for clinical use? And then as part of this process, we decide, we, uh, devise a phase one. So that's the conclusion. This is a, one of my favorite quotes. In all science, error precedes the truth, and it is better that it should go first than last. So this entire process is set up so that we make our mistakes in animals, or we make our mistakes in the dish. We don't make our mistakes in the human. And so it's not good enough in human therapy to take a trial all the way into the end of the, to take a drug all the way past the pipeline and start giving it to patients if you don't know that it's safe and, and efficacious. The two alternatives to this rule show why it's so important. To assume that the drug is beneficial and observe patients with the idea that it will be beneficial. That's a problem. And the second problem in drug development, to assume that the drug or cell therapy will be beneficial because the animal data looks so good that you start to observe the animal data and plan for the humans as if it's natural that it's going to work. And so randomization, placebo control, and blinding in the, in the development of a new therapy are critical here. Thanks. Thank you.